I'm Mike Kennedy with you. We're at Standish Landing by Spago Lake here. It's just kind of interesting. Here's the railroad tracks, but uh, this whole area was cut way back. Uh, they even removed some trees. But what I'm pointing out here is that all of this uh, plant here, autumn olive, which is considered very invasive, uh, was all gone. And so two years, or maybe it was three, I think it was two years ago, they cut it, but look at it all. It's filling right in, almost back to the tracks again. Because of course they just cut it off. They didn't dig up the roots or anything. But uh, autumn olive produces an edible fruit. It's kind of tart, but people do make uh, jams and jelly out of it. And, uh, but most people consider it a plant they don't want around. It's, there are a number of things that are edible that people feel that way about as well. But in this case, uh, we're talking about autumn olive. Which isn't really an olive at all, of course. Here's a close-up of autumn olive. We're going to look at it because we're going to notice a characteristic called alternating leaves. One side, then the other, then the other, then the other. But also you can see these will all be flowers. And then these will be where the berries, the red berries, are formed. Here's just a look at the kind of the base of the plant, so you can see the whole plant. Uh, it's a very prolific bearer, so, I mean, there are a lot of seeds on these. You basically just pull and strip the, the, the fruit off. Some people have different techniques for doing that, but it bears quite heavily. One thing that we saw in great abundance up here, but not after they cut, was mullein. Uh, considered a pioneer plant, well, you can see that, you know, over many years, uh, we have more plants growing towards the railroad track here. Even our uh, autumn olive here, growing right up by the tracks. So the soil has generally got better. And that indeed is one of the things that mullein does. It's a what they call a pioneer plant. It has a very long uh, horizontal roots that go out and pick up moisture and nutrients, bring it back to the plant. And then of course, when that plant dies, it's improving the soil for other plants to move in. And uh, we've certainly had other plants move in. I'm sure too, by cutting what they did is they changed the whole ecosystem by uh, basically, by cutting, you're basically saying, I want the things that are really going to come back and grow fast to take over. And that's exactly what it did happen. And in this case, it's autumn olive. <laughs> There's a lot of it. Oh, here's a, uh, a mullein stalk from previous years. You can see the uh, you can see the seed head. There's thousands of seeds in these. Some mullins, the stalks are so uh, strong that they were used for arrows. They were used as fire spindles to make friction fire with. And I'm looking now just to see if I can find an actual plant of it here. And it doesn't appear I'm going to looks like uh, you know there's so many other things that have grown up quickly here now that uh, they probably shaded what was there and two we've had a, <coughs> excuse me we've had an extremely wet spring and an extremely wet spring is going to favor a lot of certain kinds of vegetable vegetation and growth over things like mullein that's a, you know getting in soil where other things can't grow is kind of its strong suit not having enough moisture is one of its strong suits so in this case now this area has all changed at least for this season <laughs> well and with the autumn olives too into an environment that doesn't favor this particular plant but favors others and you know that brings in a point that I think is, oh, 
Let's look at this. Here we have a sumac, staghorn sumac. You can see there's quite a number of uh, bees. None of them honeybees, though. Looks like we might even, oh wow. Just on these heads, I see one. I see at least 10 bees on that head, three or four on this one. So uh, we've really got the pollinators at work here, but uh, these sumac heads will eventually turn red and uh, they get coated with a sticky substance that makes a very nice but tart drink. And what you can do once these rain heads, the seed heads have turned red to a certain point and it hasn't run, rained in three days, which tends to rinse off the, the sumac, uh, you put a couple heads and a couple liters of water and just let it set. And pretty soon you have this really tart drink. And of course, you can add sugar and things to make it untart. My goodness, these look like, these almost look like flies that are on these. Huh, they're not bees after all, they're flies. Interesting. They must be getting that the sweetness off of those. Huh, interesting. So we've got autumn olive, we've got sumac. My, around my area uh, in southern Maine, I'm in Standish now, but there's sumac everywhere. It's just an extremely common uh, plant. And it's like uh, people worry about poison sumac. Really, po poison sumac looks quite different and actually isn't even a sumac. And personally, I've never found it. I'm sure it's around, and you've got to be careful of it, just like poison ivy and poison oak, but I've never come across any actual uh, poison sumac. But, you know, I've seen probably pictures of it. It's in all my guides, field guides and everything. Here's a cute plant I don't know the name of. It has these bright yellow flowers. I have looked this up before, but honestly, right now I forget what it is. It doesn't look pea-like exactly, so I don't think it's a vetch, but we'll have to look this up. Bright yellow flowers. Going back to talk about mullein for a minute. Uh, the seeds are, have, uh, ex they're extremely rugged in that they can lay in the soil for up to a hundred years, waiting for their chance, their prime time to sprout. So, even though this area now is, uh, looks like it's more autumn olive in Sumacville, uh, conditions could change and we'll see all of that mullein come back up because I'm sure there are literally thousands and thousands of seeds in the soil around here. Now, I, I've read conflicting information about mullein and uh, what is needed to germinate the seeds. And I thought of trying that myself, even if I use a grow light inside. And just the point being, some people say they have to be sown on the top of the soil and they won't germinate without light. Other sources don't say that. I read one source that said uh, they needed three weeks of cold treatment. A lot of seeds are dormant and are going to stay dormant because without that cold treatment, because that's built into the seed, so they'll make it through the winter. In other words, the seed just falls on the ground and sprouts. Uh, by then, the winter's gonna come and it's pretty, gonna be pretty much over. The plant won't have had enough time to grow. Now see, this is the vetch here with these purple flowers and it's got pea-like flowers. And it is that have the little uh, things that grab onto plants. We see all these uh, jagged leaves. These are all wild strawberries here. Plenty of things with three leaves that aren't poison ivy. But of course the jagged leaves would tell you right away that this isn't poison ivy. Here's some smaller ones. This is more typically what you see for size. So again, maybe this huge amount of rain we've had this spring has really uh, helped with the vegetation, really getting a good head start. 
here we have railroad tracks and I found out later there was a guy up here and I if I had a some type of vehicle even a hand push cart that was on that I had on here I could ride this track quite of an extensive distance and uh, people would actually come and open the gates for me so I could continue on my journey there's a certain in other words if I get the you know I you need permission from the uh, people who own the rails and uh, and have the right-of-ways that, that the rails are put on but once you got that permission basically you could go along and people would uh, be very happy to open the the gates for you what we're looking at here is a large plantain plant these were brought over by the Europeans I believe the Native Americans called them footprints of the white man because everywhere white man went these were were there now it grows just about everywhere I you know all over Maine I'm sure uh, I don't know if it extends south to Florida maybe someone could comment on that but it's edible but the more common use not probably not the size would be very tough but more common use is for skin irritation you would crush a leaf up and put it on a sting or a bite we also have next to it this other plant that kind of looks clover shamrock like and this is wood sorrel this has a very tart taste uh, it's good to eat in limited quantity the tart that you see tasting I believe is from the oxalic acid and you, you just wouldn't want to try to live on that one. You would use it more as a flavoring component rather than uh, eating a lot of it. 